The name Bridget O'Donnell may not mean very much to you, yet she is among the most recognisable and famous women in Irish history. She is the person depicted in the artwork for this episode and at the links in the show notes below, but she is often considered to be the face of the Great Famine. Her image encapsulates what many of us immediately think of when someone mentions the Great Hunger. However, her fame is somewhat unusual. She didn't achieve anything particularly notable in her life. She wasn't active in politics, or she wasn't even related to powerful people of the day. Indeed, the date of her birth and the date of her death are also unknown. Bridget's fame comes more from what she endured and experienced and a chance meeting with a journalist in 1849. You see, late in that famine year, a Cork-based artist, James Mahoney, travelled to Kilrush in County Clare to report on the famine conditions in the area for the newspaper, the Illustrated London News. At that time, Kilrush and the surrounding area had gained notoriety in Britain and Ireland over the previous 12 months. This stemmed from the fact that while the community was being ravaged by hunger and disease, local landlords had started to evict tenants on a scale previously unimaginable. The crisis this was creating was shocking. When James Mahoney, the journalist, reached Kilrush, he found a state of utter degradation. He interviewed a government official, Captain Arthur Kennedy, who, although powerless to stop the evictions, had been publicising what was happening. He said that there had been a total of 2,891 evictions in and around Kilrush, leaving about 16,000 people homeless in the area. The entire region had taken on the appearance of a war zone. The evictions were extremely brutal. Not only were the families forced out of their homes, but the buildings were then demolished to stop the desperate families reoccupying them. Mahoney would capture this devastated landscape in two sketches in the near-abandoned villages of Tulig and Movin, which had been destroyed by bailiffs. The images are haunting. The houses have been stripped of their roofs and the bare stone gables leave a desolate impression. Now, once evicted, the poor were extremely vulnerable. They frequently constructed what were called scalps, little more than holes in the ground, where they crowded together to escape the wintry conditions in late 1849. That official, Captain Arthur Kennedy, told the artist James Mahoney that life expectancy of these people was about a month. They could, of course, try and gain entry to the workhouse, but this was, as Mahoney described, worse than the black hole of Calcutta. In his reports to London, published over successive weeks from Christmas 1849 into the new year of 1850, James Mahoney sent numerous sketches along with descriptions of the situation he found in and around Kilrush. These included an image of a man standing in a hut erected in the ruins of his house. Another captured a dejected tenant, head in hands, and then a more famous image of a woman desperately digging for potatoes with two children around her. However, there's one image that stands apart from all the others, and that's of Bridget O'Donnell. Indeed, James Mahoney's haunting image of Bridget standing with her two children, would come to personify not only the suffering of the people of Kilrush, but the entire famine. She became the face of that generation. Over the last few decades, her face has been emblazoned across books, websites and documentaries, given it's an image that instantly recalls a time and place in viewers' and readers' minds. Now, back in 1849, when James Mahoney met Bridget O'Donnell is unclear. It was probably late November of that year. Their meeting was presumably brief. Bridget had two small children with her, while Mahoney himself was extremely busy, given the sheer output of sketches that he would send to the Illustrated London News. Yet, in this short time, he would somehow capture the essence of the famine in this image of Bridget O'Donnell. She stands dressed in rags with a shawl over her shoulders. Her dress is torn diagonally so one knee is visible and the other isn't. There are two children, waist high, on either side of her. While their suffering is obvious, the children have slender legs and Bridget's cheeks are hollow, it is not as disturbing in the way many famine images can be. What adds to this image, though, is that while James Mahoney drew Bridget and her children, she began to relay her experiences of the famine to him. It was one that he'd probably heard countless times before. She began, I lived on the lands of Corona Tuha. My husband held four acres and a half of land and three acres of bog land. Our yearly rent was seven pounds four shillings. We were put out last November. 
he owed some rent. However, as she elucidated on the experiences of life around this eviction, it was clear the suffering this one woman had endured made her a fitting representative of the entire famine generation. A few weeks after she met James Mahoney, her image was printed on December the 22nd, 1849. It would quickly solidify itself as the image that encapsulated the Great Famine in Ireland. When there was an explosion of research and books on the Great Famine around the 150th anniversary of Black 47 in 1997, an event that coincided with increasing internet access, the image of Bridget O'Donnell became one of the most recognisable of any woman in Irish history. However, while her fame grew, her name was increasingly forgotten. Indeed, part of the appeal of her image is that she represents an entire generation rather than one single experience. But while she may be widely recognised, the question remains, who was Bridget O'Donnell? Did she actually exist, or is it possible she was just the creation of the artist James Mahoney? Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is Bridget O'Donnell, the most famous woman in Irish history. Two quick announcements before we begin. Next week is part one of my new series, Ireland's Last Aristocrat, The Life of Olive Packen and Mahan. This series looks at the life of the Irish aristocracy before, during and after the Irish Revolution. From high society balls to a deeply uncertain future in post-independence Ireland, this series lifts the lid on life in the big mansions that still litter the Irish landscape and looks into this world that is so often distorted by TV series like Downton Abbey. It's going to be fascinating. Secondly, if you're a supporter of the show on Acast Plus or Patreon, the supporter's trip to Conway Castle in Wales is fast approaching. We're heading on October the 8th. If you would like to join me, get in touch at info at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Now that trip is limited to show supporters, but you still have time to become a supporter if you'd like to join me in Conway. You can find out more at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's Patreon dot com forward slash Irish podcast. There's links to that in the show notes below. Finally, additional narrations in the episode are from Therese Murray. So now to Bridget O'Donnell. The idea for this podcast began a few months ago when I was at a meeting to select a series of images for a set of posters to mark the 175th anniversary of Black 47. You can see these posters in the show notes below. There's one of Bridget herself there. It'll give you a good sense of the woman and the image that this podcast is about. But in that meeting, while there was debate over what images to include, there was an instant agreement over the famous image of Bridget O'Donnell. It was so iconic that the connection between this woman and the famine is almost instinctive. You don't have to think about it. You just see her image and it immediately brings you to a time and place. But after that meeting, I had a long drive home and it was only then that I began to think about Bridget O'Donnell, the person. I've spent years researching The Great Hunger. I've seen her image countless times, but I never really thought about her. She was just the famine woman, just an image of someone who embodies an event, but has no other existence. In my mind, she had no past, no personality, or future for that matter. To be honest, I was suspicious that she wasn't even a real person. The sketch of her is just too perfect, if that's not a strange word to use about a famine image. If the artist James Mahoney had taken artistic licence and created a composite image of a famine victim to try and convey the horror he was surrounded by in Kilrush, he wouldn't have been the first person to do this. Now after that journey, having turned this over in my mind, I began to research Bridget O'Donnell's story in between writing the next series of the show that's Ireland's Last Aristocrat, but I kept returning to Bridget. Initially, It started just with a cursory Google search. The image comes up a lot and as you can imagine, there are the occasional lines here and there about who she was. These are often unsurprisingly incorrect. It's often claimed, for example, that she was from Skibbereen in West Cork. That's definitely false. As we heard at the start of the show, James Mahoney was in Kilrush, County Clare, when he sketched this image. The Skibbereen connection is presumably an assumption that the most famous image of the famine must relate to one of the most famous places associated with the Great Hunger. It's also often claimed that she's from Doombeg, which is a seaside town in Clare that's gained headlines recently because of its Trump Hotel, but this is also false. It probably comes from the fact that James Mahoney also sketched a woman from Doombeg who was called Judy O'Donnell. As I delved deeper, I got more into academic discussions about this image, but these tend to focus on the sketch itself and how and why it became famous, rather than what I was looking for, that's Bridget herself. 
So to try and find out more, I decided I'd have to go back to where the image first came from and work from there. So Bridget's image was first published, as I said, in the Illustrated London News on December the 22nd, 1849. It was the second in a series of articles from Kilrush by James Mahoney. But in trying to understand more about Bridget the person though, what is more interesting than the sketch is the details of the conversation she had with James Mahoney, which were printed verbatim in the Illustrated London News. Now to do this, to print a conversation verbatim, was highly unusual for the time and Bridget is one of the few famine victims whose words we actually can read. If it's the experiences of an actual person, and I still wasn't convinced yet, the story she recounted certainly helps understand that forlorn, even tragic gaze in the image printed in the Illustrated London News. Her story began, according to Mahoney, as we heard earlier, with Bridget explaining the background to her situation. Let's hear that again, because it will be significant later. I lived on the lands of Corona Tuha. My husband held four acres and a half of land and three acres of bog land. Our yearly rent was seven pounds, four shillings. We were put out last November. He owed some rent. The place referenced here is Granatuha, five kilometres northeast of Kilrush on the Ennis Road. Her account indicates that she and her husband were not the poorest of the poor. Having seven acres gave them the ability to grow crops such as oats, and this would have given them a certain degree of comfort. In the last line in this sentence, she also explained that she was evicted the previous November, so that's presumably November 1848, after falling behind in her rent. In this account attributed to Bridget, she never says much more about her husband. He's only mentioned twice in total, and on both occasions it's in the past tense, which does suggest she was a widow by late 1849 when the image was drawn. But she continued her story with a detailed account of why she was evicted. This can be at times confusing. It does contain some important details and I will explain them afterwards. But here's what she said. We got 30 stone of oats from Mr Marcus Keane for seed. My husband gave some writing for it. He was paid for it. He paid 10 shillings for reaping the corn. Now her language here, as I say, is a bit confusing. Basically, their problem started when her husband got seeds for an old crop on credit. When the crop ripened, he then had to pay men to harvest it, which presumably added to his debt. At this point, it's worth saying as well that the Marcus Keane named in this account above is a well-documented historical figure. We're going to come back to him in a minute. But at this point in their lives, the O'Donnells have borrowed money to plant a crop of oats. That has been harvested and presumably they were somewhat relieved and hopeful. Having this crop meant that it could now be sold, they could pay their rent and survive another year. However, as the famine had progressed, that man I mentioned, Marcus Keane, had become an increasingly prominent and powerful individual in Kilrush. Keane was a landlord but also worked as a land agent, managing the estates of other landlords. He garnered a ruthless reputation as someone who could collect rents even if tenants were starving and desperate. This saw more and more landlords in Kilrush entrust their estates to Keane. By 1849, he was in control of 40% of the land in what was called the Kilrush Union. This referred to the catchment area of Kilrush Workhouse, some 115,000 acres of land with 80,000 inhabitants. Now, in 1848, when Bridget and her husband fell into debt to Marcus Keane, he wasn't willing to give the O'Donnells a chance. Rather than let them sell the crop and repay the debt, He basically foreclosed on them and sent men to seize the crop itself that they had harvested. The account in the Illustrated London News continued. As soon as it was stacked, one Blake on the farm who was put to watch it took it away to his own haggard and kept it there for a fortnight by Dan Sheedy's orders. They then thrashed it in Frank Lelis's barn. This was being done, it was claimed, to pay the rent and the debt owed. After this, Keane moved on to evict the family from their home. It seems that Bridget's husband might have died around this time. He's no longer mentioned in the narrative. When the bailiffs came to evict the family though, the situation was dire. Bridget continues. I was at this time lying in fever. Dan Sheedy and five or six men came to tumble my house. They wanted me to give possession. I said I would not. I had fever and I was within two months of my down lying. The fever she referenced was in fact the major killer in the Great Hunger. Most didn't live long enough to starve to death. Instead, they succumbed to diseases which their weakened bodies couldn't fend off. The account also makes reference to Bridget's lying down. This means she was pregnant. 
As Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley explained in episode three of my series, Murder on Mother Mountain, in the 19th century, it was common for a woman to stay in bed in the final weeks of pregnancy. This also suggested that the O'Donnells had been able to keep their head above water until at least 1848, as fertility tends to decline when starvation sets in. This is the main reason why the birth rate in Ireland plummeted during the Great Famine. Indeed, when James Mahoney visited Kilrush Workhouse in 1849, there had only been four births in the previous 12 months in an institution with an average population of 2,200 people. In any case, it's clear that Bridget was pregnant. What followed in her account was particularly harrowing. The men who had arrived to evict her on Marcus Keane's behalf were utterly ruthless. Evicting people during a famine, as we heard earlier, was a death sentence in many instances. So these weren't exactly conscientious people. They arrived intending not only to evict the family, but also demolish the O'Donnell house. Bridget, however, refused to leave, and Dan Sheedy directed the men under him to proceed with the demolition. They commenced knocking down the house, and had half of it knocked down when two neighbours, women, Nell Spillesley and Kate Howe, carried me out. The pregnant Bridget was nearing death's door at this point. The priest and the doctor were called. I had the priest and doctor to attend me shortly after. Father Meehan anointed me. After this, she was brought to another house, presumably that of a neighbour. I was carried into a cabin and lay there for eight days when I had the crater. Born dead. I lay for three weeks after that. The whole of my family got the fever. And one boy, thirteen years old, died with want and with hunger while we were lying sick. Although it's not surprising, given what she had endured, there was a bitterness in the final comments to James Mahoney as she reflected on that crop that had been harvested and subsequently taken from her. Dan Sheedy and Blake took the corn to Kilrush and sold it. I don't know how much they got for it. I had not a bit for my children to eat when they took it from me. After hearing these words attributed to Bridget O'Donnell, it adds another layer to that famous image. The eyes have a new depth as you get some sense of the experiences that lay behind them. However, the question remains, is this story actually true? And was Bridget O'Donnell a real person? The account is peppered with references to historical people and details of specific places, which we might not expect in a fabricated account. Marcus Keane and Dan Sheedy, as I mentioned, were real people and are well documented in the historical record. The story also references a priest, Father Meehan. Again, Father Michael Meehan was a local priest in the area. This was certainly promising, although it wasn't actual evidence of Bridget herself. These were all people James Mahoney would undoubtedly have heard of time and again as he travelled around Kilrush. I wanted actual evidence of Bridget, so I had to take a different approach. Now, she mentioned in the account she had a 13-year-old child and also that she was pregnant at the time of the eviction. This would put her age somewhere in her 30s in 1849, putting her date of birth sometime between 1810 and 1820. Given we don't know her maiden name, we can't look for her birth record, but a better bet was a marriage record of Bridget marrying someone called O'Donnell. However, records let me down here as well. She lived in Granatuha and unfortunately it's located in the parish of Nokara and its records before 1859 are now lost. Records do exist in the neighbouring parish of St. Senans, but I couldn't find any marriage that could be Bridget's. At this point, the trail was starting to run cold. It didn't mean she wasn't real. It just means that she, like many people in pre-famine Ireland, didn't leave a trace or at least a verifiable trace. So it was, having got to this point, that I posted a thread of her life, or at least what I had found out about her life, on Twitter on Monday night. That's the day before I'm recording this episode. Now, while Twitter can so often be the most depressing of places, it actually completed the picture of Bridget for me. Mark Lagan replied to the thread with a link to the County Clare Library's website, which have extensive documents relating to the Kilrush evictions. These include the 1849 report of Captain Arthur Kennedy, who provided details on evictions he considered illegal, in a place called Gunnanity. That's definitely not how it's pronounced, but it's close to how it's spelled. But anyway, in that area, he recorded 14 evictions. The first of these was that of a person called Simon O'Donnell. The other details indicate that this was Bridget's husband. Like her own account, which she recalled to James Mahoney, it notes that the rent on the farm of Simon O'Donnell was seven pounds and four shillings. 
The acreage is slightly different. Bridget claimed that her farm was seven and a half acres, whereas this record said it was six, but I don't think that's a major discrepancy. More importantly, the record states that the eviction was carried out by the same Dan Sheedy, and crucially, the description of what happens reads as follows. Two dead, house levelled, his corn was sold for arrears before ejectment, now in the poorhouse. For me, this is as convincing evidence as we could hope to find that Bridget was a very real person. According to this record, she was married to a man called Simon O'Donnell. At the time of the eviction, they had a family of seven. Bridget, her husband Simon, two sons and three daughters. When she met James Mahoney, she had two children with her. He didn't stipulate that she didn't have other offspring still alive. Perhaps they were still in the workhouse. Unfortunately, the admission books for Kilrush Workhouse no longer survive. And the only surviving record we do have is a list of deaths from that institution in 1850. Bridget doesn't appear on that list. A 10-year-old Michael O'Donnell does, however. He died from dysentery in 1850. However, there's nothing to support a connection to Bridget other than they share the same last name. Indeed, after 1849, Bridget disappears back out of history. In 1861, a Bridget O'Donnell from Mayada took a case against a neighbour for being abusive towards her. Mayada is less than a kilometre from Granatuha, where she had been living prior to her eviction. However, there's no age listed and given her name is not exactly unusual, it's probably a bit of a leap to claim with any certainty that it's the same Bridget. However, as the historical record faded, Bridget was on her way to becoming one of the most famous women in Irish history. She probably never saw the image of herself that would make her so well known. It's unlikely the illustrated London News was being sold in rural Clare in 1849 and 1850, and if a copy did make it there, Bridget certainly hadn't the money to buy it. Nevertheless, that image that captured her likeness, and indeed her experiences, cemented her place in history. Now before you go, don't forget to check out that poster of Bridget. I have a link to it in the show notes below. It's a series of five to mark the great hunger, and they're particularly poignant and fitting, I think, in light of this and having heard Bridget's words. If you haven't subscribed to the show, don't forget to do so. Next week, I'll be back with the first episode in that series, Ireland's Last Aristocrat. That's not to be missed. So until then, Sloan.